It's my pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker today. The Honorable Saxby Chambliss was first elected to Congress to represent Georgia's 8th District in 1994. Throughout his legislative career, he has been recognized numerous times by the public and private sectors for his work on agriculture, defense, budget, and national security issues. Senator Chambliss began his second term in the United States Senate in December of 2008. He is a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, the Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition and Forestry, the Senate Rules Committee, the Senate Special Committee on Aging, and presently serves as the Vice Chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. As a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, Senator Chambliss continued Georgia's long-standing tradition of leadership and advocacy for the state's military installations. He has been a strong voice for Georgia's defense industry and the military community. He has also been a tireless advocate for improving the quality of life for troops and their families. Long before his election to Congress, Senator Chambliss specialized in representing farmers' legal interests in South Georgia. During his four terms in the House, the senator was instrumental in drafting two farm bills and reforming the federal crop insurance program. Georgia Trend Magazine, which is consistently named one of its most influential Georgians, calls him a highly visible and well-respected presence in Washington. In January of 2009, Georgia Trend named Senator Chambliss its Georgian of the Year. Senator Chambliss earned his bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Georgia in 1966 and his law degree from the University of Tennessee College of Law in 1968. He and his wife, Julianne, have been married since 1966 and reside in Moultrie, Georgia. They have two children, including son Bo, a double graduate of Mercer, and five grandchildren. In addition, the senator received a doctor's of law degree from Mercer in 2001. I present to you this afternoon our commencement speaker, the Honorable Saxby Chambliss. Well, good afternoon, and thank you, Dr. Davis, for that very generous introduction, and President Underwood, trustees, alumni, and graduates. Thank you for allowing me to share this momentous day in the lives of these individuals that are before us this afternoon. Now, there's another group of people that are here today who we should thank. On this day before Mother's Day, because of the fact that these women have played such, a, played such an integral role in the lives not only of our graduates, but in the lives of so many other people. I want to ask all of our mothers to stand up and let's recognize you. All of you dads, we're going to give you about a month, and uh, we'll have our day. But today, we're, we're proud of all of these mothers. This weekend, we celebrate the graduation of 550 women and men from Mercer University. Mercer is a very special place to me. As Dr. Davis said, my son is a 1999 undergrad graduate and a 2002 graduate of the Walter F. George School of Law. I'm as proud of Bo as I know each of you parents are of your youngsters who are graduating today. I know many of you are sad to leave this lovely campus, but remember, today is about beginnings and not endings. In fact, in Webster's Dictionary, commencement is described as the act of starting something, not the act of ending something. The friendships you've made here and the lessons you've learned will ground you as you face the joys and challenges that will become part of your life story. One of my roles here today is to remind you that as you move into the world of educated men and women, life is going to be different. Jeff Foxworthy, another fellow Georgian, is famous for reminding Americans that you might be a redneck if. Well, I recently ran across a list of things that might determine that you are a college graduate if 
For example, you might be a college graduate if your parents suddenly announce that they are downsizing and are moving into a one-bedroom house. <laughs> you might be a college graduate if your bank mysteriously sends you a new box of checks with a completely new account number. And most obviously, you might be a college graduate if your boss gives you a blank stare when you ask when spring break begins. <laughs> I know it's hard for you to read the economic news these days and to not worry about your generation and what you'll face. But just for a few minutes, I'd like to focus on three trends that have emerged since you started here at Mercer and talk about how you will be responsible for taking our collective momentum and turning it into lasting progress for our country. The first trend is a resounding way that your generation has become overnight leaders for the cause of freedom. Around the world in such far-flung places as Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, brave men and women of your generation raised their voices, stood up to tyranny, braved beatings and imprisonment, and risked life and limb to bring down some of the planet's most notorious regimes. It was your generation who gave millions of people one of life's greatest gifts, the chance to rule themselves. And what you have been doing here at Mercer for the past few years will also extend America's national interests and freedoms. In the coming weeks, some of you will join those already in uniform who are serving our country, and I salute you for that decision. <clears throat> Others of you will serve our country differently. In laboratories, some of you will tackle the problems that could prevent bioterrorism or cure diabetes. In engineering firms, others of you will invent new technologies. In classrooms, some of you will educate the next generation of America's leaders. In businesses, you will help promote America's competitiveness. No matter the sector of our nation you choose to serve, do it with excellence. Your contribution will help keep your community strong and our country great. The second trend that has emerged is a renewed focus on ethics and individual responsibility. As you enter your career or graduate school, you will regularly be faced with tough decisions that will cut to the core of exactly who you are. For more than 20 years, you've had the reinforcement of your families, your school, your place of worship, and your life experiences to guide you in determining what is right from what is wrong. But now, it's going to be up to you. A good way to think about this is to imagine that every action you take will be reported on the front page of the Macon Telegraph. If your picture were on the front page, what would you want the headline to be? Would you be characterized as someone who went out and played by the rules, or did you bend those rules to your advantage? As you wrestle with hard decisions, think about the potential consequences and turn to those that you look up to for advice. From the halls of Congress to every workplace in America, we simply must hold one another up to a higher standard. In an era when you can find every belief, every justification, and every fringe viewpoint posted somewhere online for reinforcement, it's much more important than ever to elevate the conversation about what is right and what is wrong, what is simply self-aggrandizement, and what serves the greater good. Our ethics and their consequences mirror how the world views us. The third trend is that more than ever, we are engaged in a global world. Think about it. Everything from gas prices to grain prices, from education to immigration, from the economy to our national security, every aspect of our society is affected by global forces. We feel it right here in Georgia. 
The farmer in South Georgia's livelihood is directly linked to global markets, and the carpet man manufacturer in Dalton depends on the global market to sell their carpets. It's up to your professional advantage to be curious, to see other parts of the world. I know that I am a better senator because I have been fortunate enough to travel around the world and spend time overseas learning how America can maintain its national security and competitive advantage. Technology allows us to expand our global relationships. Thanks to the internet, which tied the world together in ways that were unthinkable when I was graduating, and now to technologies such as Facebook, Skype, and Twitter. In fact, I bet some of y'all are tweeting out there right now while I'm talking. <laughs> the world is smaller than ever. <clears throat> For America to continue as the world leader, you must engage the world. Georgia may have established itself as the international gateway to the New South but it will be up to you to help us maintain that status. As you are very aware, your class faces challenges entering the workforce. You are entering a very difficult economy. When I was graduating, students got their degrees, entered the workforce, and they would sometimes keep that same job until they decided to retire. Today, statistics show you'll likely have at least eight to 10 different jobs throughout your career and may even one day have to be retrained. But I have no doubt that you will meet those challenges just as every generation of Americans has done before you. The very fact that you are sitting here today in your caps and gowns means that you're blessed. You're extremely fortunate. And as the Bible says in Luke, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Thomas Jefferson put it in a little different way when he wrote, there is a debt of service due from every man and woman to their country. I hope some of you will serve your nation in a way that I did not mention earlier and that's by running for public office. Despite what the pundits, cynics, and even the polls say, it is a noble calling. You are entrusted by voters to make tough decisions, to write laws, and not just change policy, but the very course of our nation. Please get engaged, be active at the local, state, and federal political levels. Your community and your country need you. And in these uncertain times, they need your brightness and gumption and enthusiasm more so than ever. And if running for public office is your calling, work hard at it. And if you are successful, continue to work hard to represent your constituents. And above all, stick to your principles and be bold. Thinking about the difficult world that we live in today, I'm reminded of another speech to another school. In 1941, Winston Churchill went back to his prep school, Harrow, to talk to the students. Britain was under siege, and the very survival was at stake. Most of the young men sitting before him would soon be fighting and dying in Europe and over the skies of the English Channel. With Nazi military might looming ever larger and the weight of the free world on his shoulders, Churchill stood before the young men, and after a short speech, he closed with these words, never give in, never give in, never, 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 in nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in, except to convictions of honor and good sense. Let those words be a guide as you navigate your life through bad times and good times. I have every faith that your future is so bright that it's yours for the taking. Godspeed as you begin that journey. Thank you.